Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense, common knowledge, or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do, but only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, everybody. This is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius podcast, part of the Finding Genius Foundation. Just a quick note before we begin. Finding Genius Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit, and we've started researching anxiety and depression. Our goal, or our premise, is that if you have anxiety or depression, or if you know someone that has it, you know, whether it's a coworker, fellow church member, a family member, etc., chances are if they go to a professional or if you go to a professional, they'll know one or two percent of all the possible treatments out there. What if we could assemble twenty percent of all the possible treatments for anxiety and depression and the resulting conditions that people suffer from as a result of? Them? Well, that's the goal of what we call the anxiety and depression codex. Our goal is in the next year and a half to research approximately 5,000 sources and compile all the data and put it into a uh, a curated resource for people suffering or people that know people that are suffering. Now, we do need some help to do it. To donate and or find out more about the project, go to FindingGeniusFoundation.org, and you can find more info there. Uh, Today, I don't have a guest, but what I do have is a really excellent PDF uh, submitted to me by Perry Marshall. Perry, uh, he's been a a really successful marketer for been following him, I think, for 12 years. Probably he's been doing it for maybe close to 20 years. He started off teaching Google AdWords, Google Pay Per Click, and moved on to Facebook advertising. And eventually, I started hearing from him that he was uh, studying evolutionary biology. And I read his book, Evolution 2.0. Uh, it brought out a lot of super interesting topics in biology that I just didn't know about. And uh, it was part of my inspiration to do the podcast as well. And uh, to this day, having done almost 3,000 interviews, um, I credit Perry and Evolution 2.0 for kind of getting me started on the path. So Perry now has, um, he's been working on cancer, uh, not directly, but he's working on uh, helping to promote a new and what I think actually is probably a better understanding of cancer. And as you know, if you're a listener to this podcast, um, I'm getting close to finishing my book on cancer. Perry has um, some comments in the book. He's part of it. He's one of the co-authors. But I wanted to go over this short PDF with you. It'll probably take about five minutes, but I think it's really important because it provides a framework of what is the current thinking on cancer and what is a new form of thinking that I think will be a lot more beneficial and will make cancer research actually work a lot better and faster and get us closer to a cure or get us to the point where we can manage cancer as a chronic disease but not a deadly one and keep it in check for decades you know, within the people that have it. I've had thyroid cancer myself. Thankfully, it's one of the best cancers you can get, if you could say such a strange thing as that. I say that because it's, you know, got a 95% plus cure rate uh, for the kind I had. Hopefully, had is past and it doesn't come back. But, uh, you know, I'm somewhat intimately familiar with cancer. Uh, my mother passed away last year from endometrial cancer. So, again, 
a lot of familiarity with it. Um, all right, so getting into this PDF. So I'm going to just read to you the beginning, and then I'm going to summarize some of the findings. So Perry says, uh, stage 4 cancer patients are not much better off today than in 1930, despite the U.S. government spending $250 billion on cancer research. We're also losing the antibiotics race against bacteria. Bacteria evolve into superbugs in minutes. We don't adequately understand why. These problems stem from an inadequate understanding of evolution itself. A prime reason cancer treatments fail is that the tumor cells evolve at tremendous speed by some kind of self-governing process. Chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery often trigger more aggressive cancers because the cells evolve actively in defense. They don't evolve, they're not just passive, uh, they're not slowly or accidentally changing at that point. They appear to be deliberately adapting to get around the threat that they face, which is, again, the surgery or the chemo or the radiation. Today's five best-selling popular evolution books are categorized in this PDF, and these books say little to nothing about these high-speed evolution systems that cancer cells have. Uh, they omit what Perry thinks and what I agree is the, the most valuable discoveries in the last 100 years. Now, this is part of the infographic, which will be part of the notes, but I wanted to tell you the top five books. Uh, several are by Richard Dawkins. There's Extended Phenotype, The Blind Watchmaker, and The Selfish Gene. There's a book called Evolution by Futuyma, F-U-T-U-Y-M-A, Futuyma, and then Why Evolution is True by Jerry Coyne. So these are the top five books. And uh, what Perry lays out is all five together at most will maybe give a quick nod to one of these mechanisms of evolution. I'm going to tell you the mechanisms, but uh, you can know in listening to them that none of these books really talk about them barely at all. Most dismiss them. And uh, these are critical and actual components of evolution, especially when it comes to cancer. Number one is symbiogenesis. Uh, this is the formation of a new type of organism by fusing one cell into another. And this has happened with our mitochondria. This has happened with viral DNA that has endogenized or become part of our own DNA. This has happened at least several times throughout evolutionary history, and it creates a completely new type of creature. If you think of prokaryotic versus eukaryotic cells, uh, prokaryotic cells not having a nucleus, eukaryotic having a nucleus, you know, I'm not sure if exactly that came from an outside creature, but it's a fundamental big change in a cell, and from these two cell types, at least, come tons of different forms of life. So symbiogenesis is a very important component of high-speed evolution. Um, then we have what's called uh, transposition. Cells can rearrange mobile DNA elements. Um, Barbara McClintock uh, contributed significantly to transposition. She termed uh, what was called uh, jumping genes, I believe in corn or maize, that she researched. Uh, this is definitely a common way that bacteria can rearrange their genomes to avoid antibiotics and become resistant and to trade information with other bacteria. Uh, then we have epigenetics. So we have our DNA, we have our genes, but our environmental conditions, what we eat, what we drink, what we breathe, you know, if we smoke or not, if we're an athlete, etc., all these will up or down regulate our genes. It'll make some genes silent and not transcribe anymore and not affect us. It'll make some genes extremely active where the proteins and other things they produce are extremely prevalent and active. So epigenetics is a, um, it's like a regulation. It's as if uh, we have a control panel on us of, you know, a million different switches. And epigenetics can raise or lower the switches and change them and throw the switches and dramatically change uh, what we are and how we are. If you consider dogs, look how different they are. They're all dogs. They pretty much all can interbreed. They're all the same species. But phenotypically, meaning how they look and, and act and how they uh, exist in their environment, is radically different. Just picture a Chihuahua versus a Mastiff or a Great Dane. Very, very different. So then we've got horizontal gene transfer. And this, again, goes back to bacteria, where bacteria can create what's called a plasmid. This is a membrane-bound uh, element that will contain some of the bacterial DNA. And this can come out of the bacteria's membrane, go into you know bacteria that are near it, enter them and change their gene expressions and even integrate into their genes as well. A very common way, again, that, that bacteria can defend against the threat. And if you didn't know, uh, I believe the literature says that 80% of all bacteria at any one time are in biofilms. So they really aren't, for the most part, single-celled organisms. They are in these communities where each bacteria has different abilities, 
different epigenetics, and as the whole, the community defends itself against threats. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now, back to the show. You know, whether it's, again, radiation or bad metabolites or, you know, viral pathogens or other bacteria or whatever it may be. Then there's also uh, reverse transcription, which is the ability to copy RNA and make it part of DNA. So the reverse of the process whereby DNA will become trans transcribed and then translated into RNA and proteins, um, it can go the other direction. And RNA can be incorporated into DNA. And like I told you, there's uh, retroviruses that can do this. Um, HIV, uh, other viruses are able to endogenize and become part of our DNA. I don't know if you know this, but, you know, literature says 8 to 10% of all our DNA, all our human DNA, is from previous past viral infections, which is amazing. So we are, you know, 8 to 10% virus. And some of these... Um, Abilities that we've gained by viruses becoming part of our DNA allow us to be who we are. There appears to be uh, no ability for animals to have a placenta and be placental mammals and have babies without a viral protein called syncytin. So reverse transcription definitely drives evolution. Very, very important and not well understood. Then there's uh, endosymbiogenesis. Uh, long term, but uh, our bodies have cells within cells within cells. Uh, that underscore the cooperative independent fabric of life. So endosymbiogenesis is uh, this structure. For instance, let's look at chloroplasts, and they originated when uh, photosynthetic bacteria merged with them, just like I told you in our own cells. Our, our mitochondria in our cells were supposedly blue-green algae that somehow became a part of our cells and became the mitochondria. So two disparate organisms in some cases seem to combine and create a new organism, which is amazing. As I mentioned before, there are mobile genetic elements that can move around and rearrange and become parts of genes and become part of the transcription process. So this is very common in uh, many different creatures. And again, that changes what, what can be described as a gene. If a gene typically is 100 base pairs long and a mobile genetic element appears at the time that that gene is being transcribed and adds, let's say, 20 or 30 base pairs, now it can code for different proteins, and it can have a completely different function. So there are mobile genetic elements that can facilitate this and therefore drive evolutionary processes. There are many, many more uh, elements here. I want to just bring forth maybe one or two. Uh, there's a concept of a holobion. So you and I and everyone listening, dog, cat, fleas, mosquitoes, I mean, many, many creatures are holobions. What it means is you are not just composed of human cells. You are also composed of billions of bacteria, trillions of viruses, fungi, yeast, I mean, all kinds of different creatures that make up you. Um, no one exactly knows the jobs and the dynamics of all these interactions, but without a microbiome and without all these constituent uh, hangers on that make you you, you wouldn't be you. You wouldn't function well. You wouldn't live long. You'd have a problem. You know, so it's funny, like at home, when I, I look at my dog, I, I say to them, oh, you little holobionts. Because they are. They each have their own microbiome, and they have all these other creatures that they have no clue about, and most people have no clue about, that make them them. This concept's amazing, because, uh, again, we are not just our human cells, but we are uh, an amalgamation. We're a, a city or a colony of all these different creatures that work together to, you know, to keep us going and keep us living. You know, completely amazing. So, again, there are more elements here. I didn't want to drag this on for too long, but I, I encourage you to look at the attached download PDF used by permission from Perry Marshall, but I think it's a really excellent encapsulation that takes us way beyond neo-Darwinism and way beyond the modern synthesis and shows us that uh, neo-Darwinism 
plays a small role in evolution, but I believe by no means it is the driving factor. Uh, I believe it goes way beyond uh, natural selection and random mutation. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. And all of these mechanisms that I've described here appear to be very deliberate, and they come based on the decision-making process of the organism using them. And if you consider that bacteria can use these things, um, you know, human cells can use them, uh, possibly even viruses can use them, fungi, etc. It's an amazing thing to consider. So uh, I welcome your comments about this. I'm sure there'll be a strong reaction because many people, uh, you know, say neo-Darwinism is the way and everything else is just junk or bunk. But I believe there's, there's ample scientific evidence to show that, um, again, Darwinism is only a tiny fraction of the complete evolutionary picture. So thank you very much. If you want to find out more about uh, these concepts and Perry Marshall himself, go to Amazon and look up Evolution 2.0 or Google Perry Marshall Evolution, and you'll be able to find a whole host of resources related to this. Thank you very much. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.